Hey, welcome to the New Home Insights Podcast by John Burns Real Estate Consulting. I'm Dean Worley, your host. Each episode, we're gonna bring you some of the best minds in the housing business talking about some fascinating topics or trend or innovation or issue, just like the one you're about to listen to. Enjoy. Hi, this is Dean. Just a quick note, we conducted this episode with Court Cunningham of Orchard a little before Zillow made the announcement that it would be leaving the iBuyer space. So just wanted you to keep that in mind as you listen because we don't talk about that. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to the New Home Insights Podcast by John Burns Real Estate Consulting. I'm your host, Dean Worley. Today, we have the founder and the CEO of Orchard. Court Cunningham. Orchard is a company that is is not an iBuyer. I have been assured of that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's, but it's also not a traditional broker. It's really a company, it's a company that's using technology to shake up both the buying and selling of homes in a growing part of the country. So, Court, why don't you start off? First of all, say hi to the folks and then uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me today, Dean. Um, so I am an unlikely um, participant in transforming real estate. I, I you know, grew up in Michigan uh, and have been mostly doing B2B software related things for my career. I worked at DoubleClick, which is one of the big ad platforms that got bought by Google. Um, I was at a little social networking company called Community Connect and then helped found a company called Yodel, which was double click for the small guy helping small businesses advertise online. So um, I am new to real estate, but uh, was super in- intrigued by um, the, the challenges uh, in, in the real estate industry, which is what, what drew me to it. So I'm sort of a 20 year veteran software person uh, trying to figure out real estate. That's interesting. Yeah, because you do come upon the real estate sector from a very technological background, don't you? Yes. So let's talk about that. What? uh, Tell us just to kind of, first, maybe what was the spark that led you to founding Orchard? And then tell us a little bit about about Orchard in terms of the when and the how many and the where you're at. Yep. So, you know, having, you know, built up a couple of, of software companies that had good exits, I wanted to do something big. I, I wouldn't call myself old, but I'm uh, certainly uh, not early in my career and uh, wanted to have a big impact. And so I, I started looking at industries that were just structurally not in a, in a good place and not delivering consumer value. Real estate rose to the the top of the pack. And, you know, it is just an incredible industry where through a a combination of state level regulation, federal regulation, industry structure, many of these businesses are franchised. uh, No one is set up to deliver a delightful consumer experience. And you look at how, you know, book buying and e-commerce and insurance and all these other categories have been modernized, you know, uh, taxis, uh, car buying with Carvana. And real estate was was unchanged, and and it's a very hard problem to solve, which made me think twice about before I, I jumped into the deep end of the pool. But you know, the opportunity is so big, and the consumer impact is so big. I felt I had no choice. I noticed you're not using the word disrupt. Is that intentional? Because effectively, you are in a sense disrupting the real estate world. Yeah, I'm. Um, I would say I'm an understated guy from Michigan. I <laughs> I, I don't like to wave my hands. Uh, but we're, we're transforming. Like we are a realtor, right? We're a licensed realtor and we're trying to modernize it. And I do think that the Carvana analogy is an interesting one. You know, so Carvana's background, they were a traditional uh, car dealer, used car dealer who decided to try to uh, modernize uh, buying and selling used cars. So while I, I don't have that industry background, I do view myself as a member and participant in the industry trying to help propel it into the future. Plus the word disrupt literally became a cliche the first time it was used, which is, <laughs> is hard to fathom, but I swear that's what it felt like. So when did you, when, what's the nuts and bolts? When did you actually found and get Orchard off the ground? Yep. So we were uh, incorporated in the fall of 2017. Uh, our first dollar of revenue was in February of 2018. Uh, and so, you know, we're a little less than a four-year-old company uh, at this point. We started in Texas uh, in San Antonio, uh, which we picked because it's sort of average town USA, 
average income, average home price, average everything looks like America generally. Um, and, uh, and Texas was a good market for a bunch of reasons. So yeah, started in Texas four years ago and we're now in nine markets. Was one of those reasons the, you know, relatively more compliant regulatory environment there? A little, we just viewed it as lower risk. So we do take um, a little bit of real estate risk in our business, which we can get into. And Texas is the lowest volatility real estate market in the country from our perspective. Um, and for a bunch of reasons, there's some structural reasons like you can't take out a home equity loan unless you have 20% equity in, in your house. So you don't have a lot of over levered homeowners. Uh, but then also macro reasons like People are moving there from all over the country because of low cost of living and quality of life. And all of those things provide stability to real estate prices. Right. So, okay. So now then let's get into the, the meat of what you do. Let's get into your, your services. I think your, your, let's first talk about, I think your flag flagship service, which is the move first. Yeah. Well, just, just, you know, get us started on, on what that means, what that, that key program is for you guys. Yeah, well, let me take, I'll start one level higher and then I'll, I'll get okay. to, to move first. So <clears throat> at the highest level, we do two things very differently for our customer. One is we've put all of the, the pieces of the transaction onto a single digital platform. So uh, online research of a home, coordinating home showings, getting your mortgage applied for and documents uploaded, uh, submitting offers on new homes, listing your old home, uh, receiving offers on your old home, closing on both homes, all happens on one digital platform. And that's important because there are just too many people touching the transaction in real estate. And that complexity drives friction and consumer dissatisfaction. And it also drives cost. And so we are simplifying the transaction for the consumer and taking cost out of the transaction. And that doesn't get focused on as much, but it is key to what we're doing. And we think is going to give us the ability to do pretty magical things for the consumer over time. The second thing we do is we turn our customers into cash buyers, um, which allows them to buy their new home before they buy, they sell their old home, which is what people want to do. And so that product is called Move First. You can move first into your new home before you sell your old home and do so as a cash buyer into the new home. And that, and so, and part of that is, uh, what, what are the nuts and bolts of that, the math of that in terms of the brokerage fees and things like that and how they relate to more traditional brokerages? Yeah, so we're charging sort of uh, standard fees everywhere to, in some places, slightly below market. One interesting thing that we found is consumers do not respond well to discounted fees. And the proof point there is, in, in real estate, and the proof point there is if if price was the most important thing, Redfin would have more than 1% market share 18 years after its founding. Um, and this is the most important transaction of people's lives. It's the house where they're going to you know, raise their family, build memories, uh, accomplish and fulfill their dreams. And um, you know they want to make sure they're getting the best execution uh, and the best value. And so our approach has been okay, let's leave pricing roughly where it is. On mortgage, we charge a little less. Title, we can't really charge differently for state regulation reasons. Um, but um, how do we add value to the transaction? So you know, rather than pay a 6% listing fee to a Keller Williams agent, for example, you pay us that 6% listing fee, but we will buy your new home for you with our cash which usually gets you a 1% to 2% discount. It also means that you're much more likely to win that offer than the other guy. We will move you into your new home. If your old home needs work, we'll do it at no margin. We'll put our capital to work to replace paint and carpet and clean up your old home and get it ready for sale. And we'll guarantee the sale of your old home. And we charge nothing for any of that. And that's a big difference. When you look at other people in the space, they're adding cost to the equation, right? Hey, we'll do all that but for a fee. And we charge nothing for those extra services. So leaving the fee the same, but adding value to the transaction. That's interesting. So so free actually almost just impacts the psychology of the homeowner. The homeowner is thinking, okay, I want to get what I pay for. So I, I don't care about Redfin, those low cost guys. But wait, you're adding free services? Does that kind of get them over the hump, I guess? Yeah. I mean, it's 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 
we position as value added services, right? It's yeah. like we're, 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 you know, we're giving you our cash uh, to turn you into a cash buyer. We're guaranteeing the sale of your old home. Yeah. We're fixing up your old home kind of at cost. Um, and that resonates pretty strongly with people. Yeah. So it's almost a suite of services. And, and if you think about it, it's like Amazon, right? Like, you know, I, I keep coming back to Amazon and, and Carvana, but like, you know, why do you go to Amazon? Well, you know, it's easy. Uh, it's generally lower cost. If I'm a Prime member, I get next day delivery. I get access to, to movies on uh, Amazon um, video. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a bundle of value that makes me want to go back to Amazon again and again. And, and our approach is, is the same, except the purchase cycle here is every 10 or 15 years, not yeah. 10 or 15 days. Yeah. And you do have some criteria f- uh, for what homeowners actually qualify. And I noticed that we'll, we'll speak to that real quick for us. I have a question about that. Well, so there, there are two elements. So for the, the new home, you have to obviously qualify for a mortgage. Uh, people can do that through our integrated mortgage brokerage. Um, and, you know, generally, if you qualify for a, a conforming or government mortgage, you'll qualify for our program. Uh, our underwriting criteria are, are generally aligned with, uh, with those, you know, Fannie and Freddie and, and, and the government uh, loan providers. Uh, so that's on the consumer credit side. On the yeah. home value side, we've got a pretty wide buy box and it, it varies by industry, uh, sorry, by, by region. But uh, you know, at the low end, we'll go down to $150,000 home. At the high end, in some markets, we'll go up to $2 million. Um, so it, it kind of ranges from a million to, to, to $2 million, depending on the market. I did notice, though, if I read it right, that you only do single family homes, so you won't do attached homes. Is that right? Uh, today, yes. I mean, there, you know, there, there are 5 million single family home transactions in the average year. And you know, this year, we'll do a few thousand. So we don't need to add more complexity and in inventory types. Over time, my guess is over the next couple of years, we'll start to do condos and co-ops and um, you know, duplexes and other types of, uh, of housing inventory. And there's no kind of uh, criteria with respect to like length of tenureship or something like that. But I guess to have enough equity, no, they we, kind of we've need got to it's it. on our, our website. Like you know, we won't do mat like two acres is is the biggest uh, property size. We'll we'll backstop right now. Um, you know, homes uh, older than I think we go back to. 1930 or 40 or something. So th- there's some other parameters, uh, but it's, you know, it's 75% of housing stock in America uh, can work with our program. So I, I, I call us kind of Honda for housing. We're not doing the high end, you know, the big ranch or the $5 million home. We're not doing the low end, the $100,000 trailer home. It's the broad middle where middle America lives and our customers are teachers and firefighters and HR professionals and salespeople, they're normal everyday Americans. Yeah. Now, and, and one of your other, I, I think instant equity is another one of your, your sort of programs. That's sort of part of the Move First program and that's correct? Yes. So Move First is this ability to move into the new home as a cash buyer and uh, we guarantee the sale of the old home. We call that instant equity. So that price that we guarantee your old home for is called the instant equity price. Um, and the reason we call it that is it unlocks the home equity. So if you've got a $400,000 home that you're living in and a $300,000 mortgage, you've got $100,000 of home equity trapped in that old home. And that's the problem today is to access that equity. I need to sell my home, put my stuff in storage, live in a hotel. And that's a huge pain for people. So by giving them this contract to buy their old home, uh, we unlock that equity. So it's instant equity is, is what that piece of the offering does, which by the way, is very different from an iBuyer who also unlocks that equity, but they do it by buying that home at a discount to intrinsic value, which we think is not a good deal for the consumer. So your biggest differentiator with the iBuyer model then, besides the fact, and we'll get into a second, besides the fact that you don't, in most cases, you don't really own the home, is that, are you, do you think you're giving maybe a little more fairer price to your, your clients? Well, so we, yes. Uh, I mean, so I would, I, would, I would differentiate from the iBuyer in, in a few ways. So one is we help you buy your new home as a cash buyer. The iBuyers don't do that. Two is... We give you a backstop price, this instant equity price for the old home. Uh, we don't say, hey, we have to buy your old home. And that's great because 95% of the time, 
your old home is going to sell on market. You're going to get a full market price, not a discounted iBuyer price. And that is important because we're on the same side as the consumer, right? And for an iBuyer to make more money, they need to bid down on that home. They're on the opposite side of the table for the consumer. We're on the same side trying to get the highest price for their old home uh, to sell on market. So we feel it's good to be aligned uh, with our customers. And, and actually, the, the last thing is a result of that, which is more of a business model thing. So that's from a consumer experience. But from a business model, we don't make any money on the underlying real estate, right? Because we're you know almost always just transacting and earning the, the brokerage fee and the title fee and the mortgage fee. Um, and that means we're aligned with our customer. It also means we're much less risky business model. So if you look you know, at Zillow and Open Door in their public earnings announcements, uh, their profit per customer has more than doubled in the last year as real estate markets have become tight. Well, that's great, except for when the market slows down, what happens? It goes the other direction. Our profit per customer went up by like 3%. Uh, and so we're, we're just earning our fees, you know, whether the house turns slow or fast, uh, doesn't make a difference because we're not making money on, on your underlying house. So you're more transactional as opposed to fluctuating at the market. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a, a business speak thing, but I, I view yeah. buyers as market makers and we are basically a, an intermediary taking a fee for facilitating the service. Okay. Okay. And I think it's a 120 days listing is the normal listing. Yep. You get up to 120 okay. days for your house okay. to sell before uh, we will buy it from you. And as I said, 95% of the time uh, that house sells on market in that window. God, these days, I mean, that days on market column is it, you almost never see 120 anymore. But, uh, uh, but yeah, you're right. Well, no, you're right. In the last year, by the way, in the, in the last yeah. year, we, not, we haven't bought a single old home. Oh, really? There you go. <laughs> wow. You know, I can speak to what you mentioned earlier about that the trapped uh, kind of equity for contingent buyers is that you mentioned living in a hotel. We do a lot of apartment studies here and we do our, our some build for rent uh, studies and it's, it's become more and more a major, major part of the renter profile are those folks waiting for their home, their new home to free up or their home to, to and, close. And by the way, those are the lucky ones who can afford to get a, a, a short-term rental. We've had customers uh, who, this is like their second time doing this, who lived in a tent in like a KOA campground for two months in <laughs> Texas <laughs> because they couldn't afford uh, interim housing. They wanted to save money for their down payment. Like it's it's a big problem. And they totally just adopt the lifestyle and they decide to become hippies and they pocket mulch <laughs> and they, you know, well, yeah, we like tents. We actually grew to love it. You never know. You have another little thing called offer boost. Where yeah, so offer boost is another feature. Move first is the product. Uh, offer boost is the, you know, we turn you into a cash buyer on the new home and uh, the instant equity price is the guaranteed sale price on the old home. So those are just features of the move first product. We have too many trademark names in our, 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 our website, I guess. Is it? Is it Offer Boost a trademark name? TM? I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, you do have a, uh, you, you have agents though, right? I mean, you have normal real estate agents in, in, in your markets, more uh, or less. It depends how you define normal. Uh, okay. So we have licensed realtors, uh, except they are employees. Um, so we pay them a base salary. We pay them a commission based on volume. We also pay them a commission based on customer satisfaction. Uh, that's very different from a traditional brokerage where that agent is an independent contractor, um, basically operating on 100% commission, no base salary. Um, and we think the, the base salary approach is important for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, the the agent can pay their rent without having to jam some transaction through. Uh, so they're going to be much more focused on customer satisfaction uh, than a traditional agent. But two, as employees, we can train them. You know, they have to show up to weekly trainings and have to use the tooling that we've built. And that drives a better experience as, a, as an independent contractor. Um, you can't, you, you, uh, you're not allowed to, to force those people to show up to trainings and many of them don't. And it, to be frank, it's, it's a challenge in hiring. We've hired kind of half our people from outside the industry and teach them real estate and half from inside the industry and teach them the, the new way to home, which is what we do. Uh, but a funny story that gives you a little bit of a flavor of where the industry is. So, 
Uh, there was a new hire uh, in Charlotte, which is one of our cities, and he was not showing up. We do team meetings uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays, and he was consistently missing team meetings. And you know, his manager calls him, and he you know doesn't call him back. And like in a normal company, you would never do this as an employee. <laughs> but you know, he, he's an independent realtor, and so yeah. finally the guy calls him. And he hears a siren in the background. He's like, you know, what is going on? He's like, I'm on the truck. And he said, what do you mean? He goes, I'm a volunteer fireman. Like, <laughs> I do real estate on the side uh, to kind of help pay the bills. Like, my passion is saving people's lives. And that's why I haven't been showing up to your meetings. Like, you know, this is my, real estate's my part time uh, gig. Right. It doesn't work that way. We're paying you a salary. <laughs> like, if you want to be a volunteer fireman, that needs to be on the side. But the point is, this is how the industry operates is, you know, I'm a, a, a stay-at-home mom who does this yeah. on the side, or I'm a firefighter who does this on the side. And like, that is by definition, not a professionalized experience. Yeah. But also maybe firefighting should not be a side hustle. Just a thought. Right. <laughs> I, I want them to be focused. Um, by the way, I don't think I didn't notice that you just used home as a verb, I believe, a new way to home. Yes. I, that is all, our, all our, respect. Our, our tagline. Uh, well, so the, I mean, it's interesting. We, we talk about um, internally this concept that, you know, buying is romance and selling is finance. And so, you know, the iBuyers, it's all about the price. Give me the best price. And that's all I care about. But us, we're focused on helping people buy their new home. And that is romance. As I said, it's, you know, where I'm going to raise my family and my hopes and aspirations. And so the process, so many people in the industry, you know, are focused on the process and the mechanics. The consumer doesn't care about that. All they care about is help get me to home. And so that's what we talk about our services. We're the new way to home. I like it. I like it. No, I, I like it. I just, I just had not heard it used that way. Uh, you also have a title company, I think, that's that's increasingly key to you, folks. Uh, we do. So, uh, you know, I view title as the shopping cart of real estate. And you know, you think about any e-commerce sites you've been to. You know, what's the last site you went to where you purchase? You pick all the things you want to purchase, and then you have to go to another site to buy. Like it doesn't exist. Why? Because the purchase, the selection process and the checkout process belong on a single platform. And so that's what we're doing with real estate. So yes, we have a title company, which has to be separate for regulatory reasons, but from a consumer experience, it's tightly integrated and it's just like with a bit more complication, but just like the, the checkout card on Amazon. Uh, yeah. It's another thing you check on, again, on the same platform and the same experience kind yep. of a, of a platform. And you have a concierge service too, which is traditionally, I tell me if I'm wrong, but in traditional brokers that tends to be associated with kind of the higher end niche. Again, you, you're in a, a even entry level niche. How does that work? Well, so it, it, the concierge service today, and we think this will evolve over time, but we started with just a simple consumer value proposition, which is, you know, if your house is rough for any reason, right? The, the carpet's torn up, scuffed walls or damaged walls, you know, bad countertop in the kitchen, just obvious detractors, your house is going to sell for a lower price and it's going to take longer to sell. And so what we do there is we fix those detractors. We'll come in on, on our dime, take our money and repaint, recarpet, clean up the kitchen a bit. Uh, and that has a benefit to you in terms of helping you sell your house faster and also getting a higher price. There's actually a return on that. And we do that, as I said, at no cost to you. You've got to pay us back for the labor and materials when you sell, but we earn no margin on that. It's just a, a value add service to the consumer. The, the question is, would we want to do that in new homes? Um, and that's a debate that we're, we're having. But for now, it's really about helping get the best price and best execution on the old home by putting some capital to work. Because honestly, it does make sense for that to not be free. I mean, that's a, that's, that could be a pretty big difference maker. Yeah. And, but again, like our, our, our view is the, so it's, it's a new service. Most, you know, your Keller Williams agent isn't going to come over and paint and carpet your house. And it's, we just, we want to keep it simple. Like the only place we make money is the real estate brokerage fee, the title fee, the mortgage fee. That's it. Um, and we feel that aligns us with our customers. Okay. I can't believe I just said that, by the way. I'm, I'm usually very much on the side of the consumer, but I look at that and I think I would expect to pay for that. So that's why. Yeah, I said maybe that. down the road. I, I don't know, but we're uh, so far not yet. Is there any part of the buying or selling process that you would not 
touch that you don't touch and, and shy away from? No, so uh, so the one that we we legally can't is appraisal. So we we do inspect homes for on behalf of our customers, uh, their old home, and and uh, and if they want the the new home, um, we do home insurance, which we haven't talked about. It's a small part of what we do. Um, so no, other than appraisal, which you know there are regulatory reasons why that has to be done by an independent appraiser, um, we have pretty much vertically integrated the entire transaction onto our, our platform. Yeah, that's what I thought. You Now let's switch a little bit to kind of markets. You need to focus on the market and what's happening, market dynamics, because essentially you're kind of making bets on how the market is going to happen, at least the near-term future, uh, um, you know, with, with a guaranteed price, right? You want to make that as, as tight as possible. How, how do you assess the market? What are your like key indicators that you're looking at? Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll, make a, a shameless plug for John, John Burns re- uh, research. So, uh, we are a, uh, customer of, 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 the John Burns research, uh, team. And, uh, we obviously look at, at data from the MLS, but you guys do fantastic, um, research, which, which we consume every month. So, you know, we're looking at, at obvious things like, uh, and probably the most important are the number of new listings. So how much new supply from old homes is coming on market. We look at new builds. So how much new home supply is coming on market. We look at home price appreciation, uh, both historical, which we can measure and forecast, which we look at five or six different forecasts, including John Burns. We look at days on market. Um, yeah. We look at, at uh, kind of buyer health. So interest rates and just general financial health of the consumer. Um, you know, so it is, while we, we don't own that real estate, uh, we, we are basically giving you a, a backstop price so we could own it. And, you know, so we, we don't want to overprice it because we, we don't want to own the real estate. We do want to be a backstop and on the flip side. We don't want to underprice it because, you know, if it's too low, then we're not freeing up enough of your trapped home equity. Yeah. Um, so, you know, balancing that is, uh, is hard. You know, one, one thing I will say, and it's one of the reasons we love you guys as a firm is you have all the data, but you also talk to a lot of people and you will write up just kind of your sentiment on industry trends. And I quite frankly, think that's as valuable as the data, you know, when your team has talked to all the top 10 builders and understands you know, zoning regulations and other things that are more qualitative, that also is helpful to understanding market dynamics. Don't you think, though, we should do that more on TikTok and maybe be yeah, exactly. do some dancing while we talk about that? Just a thought. Yeah, I've, been, exactly. I've been bugging John about that. With, with, with a peppy, uh, some peppy music <laughs> in the background. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell John you said so. Um, so you know, I, I agree with all those, those indicators, by the way. Another one that I like to look at is the difference between the bid and the ask, because for a long time now, that uh, asking price has been well below the sales price, and that percentage difference has been heightened. I'm starting to notice in a lot of markets that I work in that you're starting to see that bid-ask difference a little bit squeezed. It's still positive, but it's a little bit squeezed. What, what do you – go ahead. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so we, we look at we, we we've got a, a a dashboard that we look at that probably has like fifty metrics. I kind of call it the big ones. That one, and so percentage of listing selling above uh, initial list price is one of the metrics we look at. And I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's the last year. It has been something crazy, like sixty percent selling above initial list price um, in in our markets, and we're in. I think slightly hotter than, than average markets. Um, but you're right, that's coming down. So it's still high by historical standards, but it's, you know, come down 10 or 15 points. Um, you know, in a normal market, that's like 10 or 20% of the time are you selling over list yeah. price. So I was going to use that as a segue to just real quick look at your, get a sense of your crystal ball, which is, wait, do you see, do you feel the market sort of normalizing? Do you see things as sort of calming down in the, at least the near term? Yeah, I mean, so one just higher level point. So we're not, you know, the great thing about our business because we're not tied to the underlying real yeah. estate. Like the market goes up, down, or sideways. We do well, which we like. Um, you know, our our view is that when people talk about, oh, you know, the market's softening, you know, year over year, all these yeah. metrics are down. Like, yeah, they're down from like a hundred year high. Yeah, and yeah. we're nowhere near, you know, quote unquote normal. And so my view is we will slowly over the next year return to a, a more normal, balanced market. And the, the risk is, um, you know, so unlike previous 
you know, real estate crises, you know, we have a real supply problem. Uh, you know, there are 5 million fewer homes have been built over the last cycle than should have been built. All the, the baby, uh, the millennials who deferred, you know, nesting are now nesting. So you've got like increased demand, reduced supply, which is why housing prices are, are doing crazy things. The thing that will take the edge off of that is interest rates when they start to rise over the next year. But I think the Fed's going to manage that in a very gradual way, which will hopefully bring the market back in balance. Yeah, and that's the, we project that as well for, for that exact same reason is of modestly increasing markets rates. But still, we forget three and a half or even four percent will still be historically crazy low. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I've read some article, some breathless article in some you know magazine over the last week that you know uh, mortgage rates are up fifteen basis points you know in the last thirty <laughs> days, and you look at like the one year chart, they're still like the lowest yeah. they've been, you know. All, all year. And then you look at like the five year chart and it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. we're, we're at historic lows. That's what I mean. Just, just make that thing go to the left a little longer, Brad, and then you'll see you shouldn't be quite as worried as you are, Kevin. Yeah. I just gave him two names. Um, what's your, what's your biggest competition? Is it traditional brokerages or is it like a fly homes or something like that? That's doing something similar to what you're doing. So it depends how you think about it. So just, you know, from a number of transactions, 90% of it. So one, one fun stat, when we get in front of a customer in their home, we will win that, that business 55% of the time, over half the time. That's a very high win rate. And it's because we believe we've got the, the best offering for homeowners. So uh, of the people that we lose, either because you know we went to their house and they decided they didn't like us, or we didn't get into their house, you know, 95% of the time, they're going to a traditional brokerage. You know, it's it's a friend, a relative, someone they know from school or church or whatever yeah. it may be. So that is the competition, you know, just based on where our non-buyers uh, are, are going. But obviously, we don't really worry about the traditional guys as a competitive set because they're not innovating. Um, so the, the innovators are people like Fly Homes, who has a similar offering to us, um, and people like Homeward and Knock uh, and Ribbon, who are kind of uh, trying to enable the traditional realtor to compete with us. So they're the ones on, and, and, you know, and open door, I think will start to innovate more and, and Zillow is, is doing some innovation. So those are the folks pushing the frontier uh, with us. Um, so, but in general, we don't spend a lot of time focused on the competition. Like we are maniacally focused on creating a magical consumer experience and taking cost out of the equation. And if we've got the best experience and the lowest cost, like we will win over time, which is is what we, we plan to do. Do you see any of the traditional brokerages? Because, you know, they have a major market pr presence and some of them are really, really big outfits. Do you see them yeah. attempted to innovate and pivot towards closer to what you do? Um, I mean, they're going to try. The question is, will they succeed? Most of what you've seen happen has been partnering and the problem is you're taking a transaction where too many people are touching the transaction today, and then you're adding more people to the transaction, right? You're adding a, a homeward or a knock or a ribbon. So that's another person, another process, another fee. Um, and so I, I, don't, I think that's going in the opposite direction. I think you have to vertically integrate this to simplify for the consumer and to reduce cost. And so, you know, like Realogy and Keller Williams are the two who have the best chance of doing it. You know, Keller Williams has an army of developers down in Austin, south of the river. Um, you know, I haven't seen anything consumer facing that's game changing yet, but, you know, um, only the paranoid survive. So, you know, may, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe they will surprise us one of these days. Words of, that's a nice pearl. So very good words of wisdom. The par <laughs> only the paranoid survive. That's that was actually scary, Andy Grove, but... the founder of Intel. Was it? Uh, he was, oh. They were known for their rapid development cycles. Like, why are you so maniacal about <laughs> developing a new chip like every nine months? They say, because uh, I don't know what the competition's doing. Only the paranoid survive. But the, so for a traditional brokers to do that, though, is it would just have to be such a sea change. It, it reminds me a little bit of Kodak, where they made so much money on film development and film. And they had this really good digital camera division, but they buried it because they just didn't, they couldn't just go whole hog into this new technology that turned out to be the winner. 
Uh, that's right. And, you know, there's, I mean, there's book business books written on this. One of the more famous one is Clay Christensen, Clay Christensen, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's about exactly this, where your, you know, your profit pool today is driven by a mode of distribution, which is, uh, is not going to be the long-term mode of distribution. And so, you know, in, so our agents make more money than the average real estate agent out there. They do uh, five to six times the number of transactions per year of the average agent. They're way more productive because of the training and the technology and the system we've built. And rather than us capture that profit, we're using that to give back to the consumer, right? So in a world where you look at Compass, who's publicly traded, Keller Williams isn't, um, you know, their margin after agent compensation is 18%. Four years ago, it used to be 22%. So what does that tell you? It tells you the agents have the power. They're saying, pay me more. I'm going back to Keller Williams or Realogy or wherever. And that's not a very big profit pool to innovate on things. Uh, and so, and they have the added problem of, you know, if I'm an agent, like what does a brokerage do for me? They basically give me a license, which I can rent from multiple places. They give me leads, which I can buy from Zillow. And they give me a technology system to manage my business, which now I can rent from places like side, uh, or I can go to one of these, you know, what, what are called, you know, no fee brokerages like EXP or Fathom, where they take $500 a transaction. And so the power is on the agent side. And what's ironic is as they capture more and more of the profit pool, the traditional guys will, I think, be under real pressure. Um, and, they are, that is going to enable us uh, to accelerate faster because that independent agent team in Dallas with 10 people cannot do what we're doing. Yeah. And also remember, your agents also don't have to fight fires on the side. So that's, that's helpful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it frees up their time. Yeah. Um, what's, th what's the most dangerous part of the process for you? Is it, uh, is it rapid market changes? Is there, or is there any, no real major danger point? In the process. Um, yeah, I would say, um, I mean, so the risk to the business are, you know, look, we, we do need capital. We're, we're buying those new homes with cash. So there's a capital markets risk. We need access to capital. We manage that by having multiple lending partners with staggered maturities and um, making sure we always have sufficient liquidity to run the business. Uh, second is human talent. So we actually in a couple of markets had to turn people away uh, in September and we're still doing it in two markets. We're going to turn everything back on because we just didn't have enough people to execute the business. You know, we're growing three X year over year and we couldn't hire and train people fast enough. So that is something that we're investing more there. Um, and then from a, from a, a balance sheet risk perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think if prices change really rapidly, uh, there is risk to the business. But what's nice about it is because we are capturing margin from real estate and title and mortgage, we can withstand a pretty severe downturn. So if 2008 happened today uh, and you ran those scenarios in terms of price declines through our business model, uh, we would still be profitable. We'd be obviously less profitable, uh, but we'd still be profitable. That's nice to know. It, it, okay, now you're going to hate this question, but what is the biggest downside risk to your clients? So uh, you're going to hate my answer, which okay. is <laughs> I really don't see one. Um, so and I'll, 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 and I'll tell you, like, so I could work with, let's just go through the categories. A traditional agent, I, I always have Keller Williams as the because I think they're the biggest, um, you know, where do I, I don't get a, a cash offer. I don't get a backstop price. I don't get concierge. I don't have a single platform with a single point of contact, but I pay the same fee. Why would I do that? I could go work with Zillow or Open Door, where they're not going to help me on the new home. They're not going to have a, a, a seamless transaction management platform. And they're going to force me to sell my old home at a 5% discount to intrinsic value. And if I've got, you know, in that example, I gave $100,000 of home equity, but, you know, 5% of, of the home is $15,000. That's, 15,000 of my hundred thousand dollars of home equity is going to Zillow and open door. Like that's not fair. Uh, so why would I do that? Um, you know, so 
it's not really clear what if, if there's a better alternative out there. The the one if if you're gonna be you know uh, kind of point fingers, so the, there is yeah. one small added cost to our uh, our offering, which is we do charge rent on the new home while you're there for your kind of sixty to ninety days. It's you know not a ton of money. It's maybe a few thousand dollars of cost, but that is the one added cost uh, to the equation. Yeah. Would a traditional brokerage say, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong, that you don't have the maybe the local nuance that that they do? So uh, that is what exactly what they say. You know, I know Stone Oaks in San Antonio, or I know Denton in Dallas, or whatever the submarket is, and I do more transactions. And uh, today they're right; like those power brokers in those submarkets do more than we do over time. Uh, we are are going to be able to say we're every bit as local as you are. But today we can still say, look, we yes, that's right. But we have uh, we are the most accurate at pricing old homes, and we've got the data to prove it. Where uh, you know our homes sell faster and at less discount from list price than others on the market, which means we're getting the price right. So yeah, we we may not have done a hundred transactions in Denton, Texas, but we're really good at pricing homes, which is a really important part of the real estate transaction. And, and you're, at least to me anyway, surprisingly a big part of your business is in the new home sector, right? It is. Uh, and part of that's by design. We, we have some channel programs with new home builders to try to make it easy for them uh, to work with us. Uh, and part of that is just the price point that we operate in where there's, you know, there's not an, a, enough existing home inventory and people are going to new homes. So yeah, it's roughly kind of 25, 30% of our business wow. is people buying new homes. And you're geographically remind us you're in Texas, you're in uh, eight or 10 markets. Yeah. So uh, four cities in Texas, all the big cities in Texas, uh, Denver, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia, Charlotte, Raleigh, and Metro DC. Uh, and we'll be launching um, in Washington State uh, and Portland, Oregon, and uh, entering uh, iBuyer Central, going to Phoenix, uh, Arizona, Phoenix, where okay. every iBuyer uh, is because we're open door started. iBuyer and Build for Rent Central, too. So, you yes. have some couple of things going on there. Uh, how do you decide where to go in to a, a market next? Yeah, I mean, so we do try to pick lower volatility markets um, that have you know all the the dynamics we talked about in Texas in terms of macroeconomic growth and net in migration. Bigger is better, obviously. Uh, more transactions, more opportunity. Newer housing stock is important. It's easier to value um, and less deferred maintenance, and therefore less risk. That said, you know our ambition is to be a national platform, and so you know in the next couple of years we'll be in. Suburban LA, suburban New York. Uh, we're not going to do anything urban, uh, at least in the next few years. But our plan is to be a, a national platform. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I heard. I heard LA. I was going to ask you the next question. Was ever coming to California? So suburban LA. All right. Be careful, the Antelope Valley. I'm just saying. <laughs> be, 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 roll your windows up. I'm just kidding. Sorry, Antelope Valley. I'm joking with you. Um, what might be next for you is you might get into the world of being a direct lender. Do I have that right? Uh, that is something that we are planning on doing at, at some point over the next uh, 12 months. And uh, the reason for that is it comes back to the reason we make every decision, which is how can we drive a better customer experience? So when we look at, you know, when people say I'm not happy with Orchard today, it is around the lending experience. And we work with some great lending partners and we will continue to, um, especially for you know government loans and jumbo loans. But you know, 70% of our book of business is conforming Fannie Freddie uh, loans. And we think that we can automate that and drive a much better experience where you don't have to call your loan officer to get a pre-approval letter. You can kind of print it out at any time where we can do appraisals faster, where we can have you fully underwritten and, and documented from a loan perspective in a matter of days, not weeks. Um, and that's harder to do in, in the jumbo space and in the, in the government, you know, kind of VA FHA space, but in the conforming space, we believe it can be done. So, and so, I mean, again, you come back to Amazon, everything they've done is how do I drive 
more value for the consumer. And this, it's a big thing to do. It's going to take a couple of years to get right, but we've decided to make that the next, uh, next frontier that we go after. Yeah, that, that will be a big step. Uh, I love that you call yourself, you use it earlier, the Honda for housing. You're not just for rich, rich folks. That's a great title. I, someone tell you, hopefully you'll know the name, but there's a university of Colorado professor researcher in the real estate world who called you power buyers. Yes. Do I have that right? Yeah. His name is Mike Del Preti. He's a very smart guy. And is, I, I highly recommend his, his research. He covers the real estate industry broadly from like a business model perspective. Um, yeah, he, he did that. I, I think it's a okay name. You know, I, it's yeah. a category name, like to, for two reasons, one to differentiate from my buyers, which we're not. Exactly. Uh, and two, yeah. to make the point that we are predominantly focused on helping the consumer buy the new home. Um, whereas the I buyers predominantly focused or exclusively focused on selling the old home to the I buyer. So I think it's a, it's an okay name and he's got, you know, uh, other direct to consumer companies like fly homes. And then he has the middleman, you know, knock and, and ribbon, okay. uh, and homeward in there who are trying to help agents, you know, offer something similar to their customers. We, we, we want to get you a new category name. So, uh, for uh, option A was power broker. And if you like that, I thought of it. If you don't like it, John Burns, my boss thought of it. So what do you think yeah. of that one? Uh, I think it's good. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's good. We're, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, we've, we've spent four years trying to figure out what is a good category <laughs> name. And the problem is like, you know, so I come back to where the Amazon for real estate or where the Carvana for real estate. And that is mostly true, but not quite accurate because the human element, that relationship with what we call the home advisor, the licensed realtor is really, really important. People want a knowledgeable person who can advise them. So it's sort of Amazon with a human person advising you along the way. So every analogy we try to come up with doesn't work, but uh, if you like Power Broker, I, li- I like Power Broker. So uh, you, like, you know, I, I have an option B that I have an option B that I like better. And weirdly, John and I actually thought of this independently and each email each other about this. But what do you think of iBroker? Is it too restrictive or, you know, it's, 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 a, it's catchier, I think. But yeah, I, and iBroker yeah. gets to, you know, the whole digital platform. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, and, and, you know, you're a broker for the most part, you're not taking balance sheet risk. Um, yeah, that's actually not bad. I, I think that's actually better yeah. than than Power Buyer potentially. We thought so too. If you like it, go for it. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll start pushing it and see what sticks. <laughs> see what happens. Awesome. Well, Cart, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been fantastic and, and really eye opening because again, you're doing something. You're doing something that's a very it's, that seems on its face traditional, but when you dig a little deeper, it clearly is not. Uh, that's right, and like you know for go if, if you think like oh this is just like you know traditional like listen to some of our customer testimonials on our website or any of the review sites you know you can see it and feel it and hear it in their voice like this is really magical for people and it's it's what gets me out of bed every morning awesome awesome well thanks for coming on so much it's thanks, been a Steve. pleasure really appreciate awesome. it that was court cunningham from orchard And that's it for this week. This is Dean Worley for the New Home Insights podcast. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.